Welcome back to Garage Time. My name is Tom and we're going to be working on the differential housing today. Last time we left off with the pinion shaft, the main shaft, those are both complete, but they need to go into the housing and this is where things get a little bit more complex. Up until now, all the gears, the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and reverse, none of those gears are adjustable. As long as you use the serialized gears that were matched at the factory, the distance between gears is fixed by the distance between the shafts, and that's determined by the bearing housings in here. That's not an adjustable thing. The ring and pinion is adjustable, and it takes all the torque from the pinion shaft and turns it into a transverse torque. So it takes a right angle. Power comes you know, through the engine, through the gears, out through the pinion shaft, turns that little pinion gear, and then it creates torque on this direction. And that's what goes out to the drive wheels and makes you go. But it's a very substantial gear. It has to have three things. It has to have the correct pinion depth, which is how far the pinion protrudes into this housing. It has to have the correct distance. The crown wheel has to be correctly set from left to right in the housing because that affects the, um, the contact pattern and it also affects the backlash. So those three things, pinion depth, um, the, uh, the carrier preload, the carrier position, and then also the carrier and pinion backlash that's what you have to adjust, and that's what is most difficult. Now, if you've been watching my other video on my 356, I set up the ring and pinion on the 741 transmission. That's just the code name for the four-speed gearbox in the 356. And I made this, this tool, which is, is there to, to measure the pinion depth. And so all this is, it's an old carrier from, I think this is from a 914. And I've, I've put a dial indicator inside there. I don't know if you're able to see the, the numbers in there, but there's a digital dial indicator in there. So basically what this plunger does is it tells you how far the pinion is from the center line of the differential. You just put it in the housing with its stock bearings and you make sure it doesn't have any axial or longitudinal play. And if it's in there firmly like it would be in the transmission, I can just rotate this, touch the pinion, and get a measurement, whatever the, the smallest number is, that's the pinion depth. And then we'll compare that to what is inscribed on the end of the pinion gear. So the factory would run these gears in a big gear machine and they would measure the most efficient power transmission between the pinion gear and the crown wheel. What makes the least amount of noise and how, how quiet the gears are when they're spinning and they run it through and they lap the gears together and then they, they record those numbers, they etch it on the back of each of the crown wheel and the pinion gear, and that is the recommended setup. The other method is the paint pattern method. You, you basically just paint the gears, you assemble the whole thing, you rotate it through, and you look at where the paint is worn away. And that'll tell you if the contact patch is like centered in the sweet spot of the gear. Um, that method is not quite as accurate as the uh, pinion depth me method. So Porsche wants it to be 0 0.03 millimeter tolerance. That's a little bit, that's about a thousandth of an inch. So using the paint method, I don't think you're going to be able to align the gears within a thousandth of an inch just looking at how paint's rubbing around. I mean the paint itself is thicker than a thousandth of an inch, but it is a method that people use. But because Porsche goes through all the trouble of running these at the factory and giving you an optimum setting for the gears that I have in this gearbox, it really makes sense to go, go with that. And I know this differential ran quiet when it was in the car last. So I'm basically just gonna restore it back to factory dimensions. The uh, manual, the factory workshop manual, basically says the contact pattern is obsolete. You don't even need to do it. I'm gonna go ahead and knock this seal out because it's gonna get replaced and it's just gonna get in the way of the measurement. So I have this push tool, I'm just gonna hammer that out. That guy came out with some speed. I also got the seal out of the cover. So now this can go on here. 
And that's going to hold that measurement tool in place, but we got to put the bearings on it too. So let me take the bearings off the original differential. I mark my homemade tools with what they are. So this says diff carrier and basically it goes there. So now when I put the puller underneath here, this center part of the puller has a place to hang out and then it should just yank it right off. The other nice thing about this design is Porsche puts these little, little divots there for your puller to go inside. And so you kind of have to have the puller that'll fit right in there. This one does, so let's, let's take it off. So turn it so you can see. Normally you would pay attention to what spacers go to which side. Two point eight two. And oddly enough, this one actually has a mark on here. Two point eight or it looks like twenty eight, but that's two point eight. Let me measure it again. It's a little strange, but this bearing uh, feels a little looser than the other side did. So we need to look very carefully that there's no spinning happening on the differential. There's some circular marks here inside the bearing too. So that could mean that this whole housing might be trashed. And I think it is. Because I can put my fingernail on there. This is what the surface should look like there on the bottom. And this is where it looks like that bearing has been spinning on there. And uh, that's going to make a grumbling sound and obviously eat itself. So we may be taking this whole gear off and putting it onto a different differential housing. I have another one. Um, it's not that one. It's uh, I have another one. So I might uh, have to sacrifice that. This crown wheel though on this gear is good. This is probably the most expensive thing in your transmission. The teeth on this look great. Here's the, uh, <clears throat> here's those numbers I was talking about, serialized 620. This is the backlash in millimeters. But yeah, that's bad news about that right there. And I'm gonna substitute a little thicker spacer on the test tool only because I wanna guarantee that there is going to be some preload on this. So I don't have to take them on and off multiple times. Also, this diameter is turned down slightly, so these bearings should fit a little bit easier. I'm gonna have to tap it down, but uh, it shouldn't be too bad. Okay. That side is seated, so now let's do this side. This knob here, it just helps me turn the tool, but it's removable. So I can put the other bearing in without, without breaking the knob there. I can see a small gap here on the side cover. That means that the bearings are under preload and I can just tighten up some nuts here um, and, and get that spacing nice and even. I'm not worrying about torquing it down 100%. I just wanna make sure there's no movement of the carrier in this direction or in this direction. So that's the carrier in there. This is the measurement tool. And so you see that pointer right there. This pointer is what is going to measure the pinion depth. As it sweeps over the face of the pinion, it's gonna measure the biggest number there. And then um, this is sort of upside down right now. The indicator can be read on that side. Okay, now it's time to put the new bearing races in the differential housing for good. So I'm gonna put this in the barbecue, heat it up to like 200, 250 max. And then those bearings should drop in place. Now I've already checked the previous bearings. They weren't loose in the housing when it was at 200. So I'm hopeful that I'll have to, you know, push the new bearings in with something of a little bit of force. And I'm also going to use something which is a little bit controversial, uh, Loctite 660. 
it's just an added measure for securing the bearings in the housing. So when this thing gets up to temperature, the Loctite 660 loses some effectiveness, but it's better than not putting anything in there, in my opinion. So I'm gonna go for it. So Loctite 660 is specifically for bearing clearances, and I'm just gonna use it very sparingly. Um, it'll handle, you know, gaps up to like 20 thousandths of an inch. And in this case, I have like a negative gap. So it's not going to do that much, but it is a little bit of added insurance. So we'll, we'll put it in. I think a lot of it's just going to wipe off and it says to apply it to both sides. But like I say, I'm just smearing a real thin coating of this on here. I have my, uh, my, my press tools ready. I'm going to use these. Okay, so here we go. It's just getting tight there. So we just give it a few taps and it should be right there. So that's how loose it is. Um, this housing is two, like 220, and that's, that's the uh, danger there. I mean, you can't spin it, but let's just hope that stays put. Get it started. Same thing. You can't, you can't spin it once it's in there and it's actually, you know, heating up, but you know, these are old cars and it's subject to these kind of expansions of the uh, magnesium over time. So let's hope that that's uh, going to be a winner. It's the best I could do on this one. You can see just a little bit of the stuff oozing out. That's the Loctite. So I'm just gonna wipe it down with the rag and just call it good, but it's, you know, it's in there a little bit. Now, because this stuff is gritty, I want it all gone. I don't want any of it, you know, hanging out here in the uh, recess. So I'm gonna make sure that this is fully cleaned up. I might use a little acetone, make sure this is absolutely clean. And that's also why I didn't just goop it on there either. You don't want too much of that stuff in here. And here are the rebuilt shafts that we completed last time. Um, there is a mistake and Mike in Australia pointed this out to me. I have these washers on the same side as the bearing and he said that this thrust washer should be on this side. So there's one on each side. And I, I, I agree with that. I'm going to correct it later but here's some information in the workshop manuals that make it a little bit confusing. And there really is no definitive way, but I looked at my old video and I saw that there was one on each side. So thank you, Mike, for chiming in and helping out, super constructive, really appreciate it. Uh, he's done a few more of these than I have. So that's awesome. Thank you, Mike. And, but for now, I'm gonna put it together as is. I think I probably would have noticed this eventually um, when it goes in the housing. So I'm gonna put it together this way. This is gonna come in and out multiple times. I just wanna get the measurement here on the end of the pinion. And while we're here, let me show you the numbers here that are etched on the end. So the number 620 is the number that coincides with the number on the crown wheel. That means they're a match set. And then the N24, that is the um, deviation from the nominal spec. I've also cleaned up these shims and I'm just gonna document them before I put all this together and just get a number for it. It looks like this shim is uh, 0.2 millimeters. 0.2. And this guy is also 0.2. A little bit thicker, but I think nominal 0.2 on this. 
the number I'm getting is, you know, 0.215. So I'll write that down, probably just right on here. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they were like that. There's bearing marks on that side. And then now I'm just gonna go ahead and put both shafts in and um, I'm gonna do it in this orientation because I think it's a little easier here going vertical than it would be on the engine test stand. Just gonna let that be right there, see if we can sneak this guy next to it. These came out as a assembly, but we can try to work them in. Just want them to line up and drop in place. Let's see if we can do it. Just make sure the gears are all happy. I think I have them both. Yeah, so it's in neutral, so we should be able to just let her go down, get the bearings inside the races there. Yep. That guy's going in. And yeah, there they go. I have some blocks of wood here supporting it up a little bit so that that main shaft can, can go through without hitting the table, but it's all the way down. So I'm gonna go ahead and start putting the nuts on it. It is smart to put both in and torque everything, including these nuts up here, because it changes the forces in the housing and that can affect the pinion depth. Um, a, a small amount, but I believe it can affect it. So. I'm gonna go ahead and follow the workshop manual to a T. Another uh, common upgrade on these transaxles that I'm doing to my other one is a one piece bearing retainer at a 7075 aluminum. It basically has, does a better job of keeping these two shafts together because as torque is transferred from one shaft to the other, the input shaft is this one, it transfers torque to this one. Because of the way the gears have a, a point to them, these shafts are always trying to pull each other apart. And if you have a one piece bearing retainer, it actually strengthens the housing and keeps these shafts together as much as possible. Um, there's some significant forces always trying to rip these gearboxes apart. And then this is the issue here with the double washer stack. So what I'm doing is uh, theoretically, this washer is supposed to be up here. And when you put a straight edge across the bearings, they are actually level uh, right now. So the question is, if I take one of these washers out and put it up here, that's gonna lower these rollers down and it's gonna ride differently on the, um, the center sections. And see how these rollers are just a little taller? There's more roller exposed than that side. So that tells me that this one needs to get lowered down by the thickness of that washer right there. Some of these are hard to get to, so I got to use this crow's foot thing. But these are torqued to 15. Right now, the, the car is in neutral. This is the input shaft, so output shaft isn't spinning at all. If I wanna to go to first gear, it's this one. Now the input shaft is spinning much faster than the output shaft. And then I would go to second, which is right here. That's second gear. Then third gear is this one, but this one has to go back into neutral. So this is neutral, neutral, and then third gear is this guy. Snaps into third gear. Now the output shaft is going even faster. And then fourth gear is straight forward. Boom. Now the output shaft is going one to one, or I guess it's slightly overdrive in this transmission. This gear is slightly bigger than this one. And then fifth gear is gonna be out here. We'll install that next. I just wanted to show you real quick 
<clears throat> how these uh, sliders work and how it engages the different teeth. This has to slide in perfectly even. This is the one that has the extra washer on the wrong side and it is riding a little bit too far outward. So I'm not sure I would have noticed that. I think it's better if it's, if it's in that way. I think we'll get that fixed next time we pull it apart. When you, when you put the gears on and then you torque this down, that's basically gonna take this whole pinion and it's gonna stretch it. And that's what we want it to do. We want it to stretch so it's in its final torqued setting and that stretch will affect the um, amount of distance here on the pinion. So I guess it's this one that stretches, but let's go ahead and put those gears on just temporarily so we can torque those bolts and then we can finally you know, do the measurement. You basically gotta put the whole thing together. Okay, I found a nice shiny magnet that would work well on the end there. The problem is with this, and the reason why I don't like it, it's, it's so strong. This is a Neo magnet. Um, it, it's pulling on my um, micrometer and it makes it really difficult to measure it. A piece of shim stock would work equally as well, but these blades are pretty consistent. So I get the blade is 0.233. Okay, so now when that indicator goes to the middle, it's on that, that razor blade. So that's gonna be the, the minimum measurement's gonna be right about there. You can feel the bearings getting loaded, which is great. You can't feel any play, that's the trick. You can't be up or down or in or out. It's gotta be very much in the center of the uh, housing in order for this measurement to be accurate. But I think we've got it now. So now that the cover's got some, some uh, bolts in it or nuts on it, we can flip this upside down and then look at the uh, actual gauge. There it is. So I'm getting 0 0.0655. And I gotta do a lot of math to really subtract the razor blade thickness and take the nominal dimension and you know the calibration dimension. So I'm not gonna bore you guys with the math, but the measurement is getting very repeatable numbers. Let me show you what the gauge looks like from what, where I can see. I'll try to get the glare away from there. So I'm getting right there, 655. It'll stay there for a little bit and then the number will get bigger again. And I go back, 655. And then the numbers get bigger again. So I'm looking for the minimum number. Okay, I looked at the book. It's uh, nominal dimension 66.3. And then the deviation is 0.24 millimeters. So that means the target dimension, if I understand it right, is uh, 66.54. And I converted, I, I changed the uh, indicator to read in millimeters because it made the math a little bit easier. And what I'm getting is I'm getting 66.44. So I need to move the pinion back just a little bit. And um, I'm gonna double check my math and double check the torque readings and spend a little more time on this. But it looks like I need to order another spacer of 0.1. Um, and that'll give me some flexibility and I'll, I'll go ahead and do all this again when I get the final shims in there. But today's goal was really just to kind of get it set up and also to uh, order some more shims. And hopefully next time I do it, I'll have all the right parts. Thanks again guys for watching. And uh, like I said, I need to focus a little bit on the math, make sure I'm not making any mistakes. But for right now, we're on the right track. Take care, see you next week.